Hi, welcome to NDE TV. I'm Peggy Robinson. Today's guest is Michael, and you're in Israel at the moment? Yes, ma'am. Okay, now was your experience in, was Illinois? Yes, it was in the United States. Okay, I'll let you start wherever you like and take as long as you want. Okay, so um, thank you for having me, first and foremost. Um, after seven years of trying to solve the quiz, seven years of trials, seven years of lessons, and seven years of me still ricocheting from the experience that happened to me. And with all due respect to the name of your show, I didn't have an NDE. I was a walk-in, which is maybe a term that not many people are familiar with. I'm familiar with the Kabbalistic term of that, which is Jewish mysticism. That goes back and describes the same thing as the new age walking is described, which is the process where a soul enters the body while the person is still alive. And there's also some sort of an agreement between the souls that this visit, that this exchange is for a good purpose. All the time is for a good purpose. It's part of maintaining the balance between good and evil in the world. Just like there is a physical one, there's a spiritual one. So what happened to me is that the soul would make agreement, and I will go right to the story in a second here. The soul will make agreements to exchange in return of keeping all the memories and almost like still having the former soul present. And I didn't know what happened to me after the accident. And I think that the thing I'm still shocked about is the amount of damage, the amount of severity that that accident created as far as impact goes. To the end of my story is a miracle by itself. And it's not a proof that there wasn't no death there. See, near death happens when people literally almost crossing over. And after crossing over, they are able to come back. And they all describe the same thing almost, a lot in common. And I'll go back there as well, but this is what not happened to me. To me, it was like an exchange, almost like a file transfer, if you will, between two devices. And it happened in a moment of impact. And it was that moment of bliss, that dimension between this world and the afterlife. It's not straight there, if people wonder. It's like an elevator. There's many, many, many steps. Just like steps in the physical world, we do the same spiritually. What happened was that I was working as a correctional officer at the time, at the maximum security prison. I needed that because I was a new legal immigrant. I was married to an American woman. I have American kids. I lived there. I was American myself after 15 years nearly. So I wanted to serve the community by working at this maximum security prison. It was a state job. So at the time, it generated some good funds as well. And I remember that the agony, the bad energies, and negativity that was there every time I went to work is something that many, many people don't understand. And that's good that they don't because it's kept in those prisons away I from used society. To work at a maximum security women's. I know what you mean. So you know exactly what I mean. And this is good because I'll be able to share with you the amount of energies that we take in. And a lot of us on the outside look like we're fine, but not a lot of people know the correctional officers a lot, a lot of them, the majority of them are PTSD patients later on in their life. Some of them, unfortunately, take their own life, even though they have no other reasons. Some of them get into addictions. It's because they absorb it. And there's so much that the soul can take. The body can think about the money and the benefits and all that. But the soul is being tortured when you're around that amount of negativity. And there was like a sponge to me because I was trying to deny it and live a very happy, motivating life. I was also a martial arts instructor. So I was just everywhere, making money, enjoying the physical, yeah. totally a different person, totally a different person. 
And I was just working there and just taking it like a sponge. And then I remember that at nights became work because I always do work the night shift. So it used to be nights that I would work and then I couldn't sleep the whole day after and just like roll over night to night. And, and that took a toll on me. And at the time we were short in manpower. So it was mandatory overtime that we all had to do. And there was 14 hour shifts of taking in the violence, the screaming, the spiritual energies that you don't see. All you see is gore if you're not a spiritual person. But now if I were to go there, I would just get away from the spiritual stuff that's going on. And at the time I just took it and I was tired. And I remember my days off were in the middle of the week, Tuesdays and Wednesdays, which are the worst days off you can have because it's not the weekend. I didn't have seniority. And um, I just remember driving back home, this, you know, Midwestern town, Americana, nothing but cornfields, just like an hour drive to commute and an hour back. And all I remember is this road was like 70 miles per hour at a time. And I don't know for people to watch you around the world, how much it's in kilometers. I believe it's like around 110 or something like that kilometers per hour. It was pretty fast. So I kept the speed limit and I remember driving and I don't know what happened if I closed my eyes or if I got distracted or if anything. I really don't remember that part. But I remember it was a split second. And the moment I woke up, it was like there was no hydraulic fluids in my car, like everything locked, the wheel, the brakes, like everything was just solid steel. I couldn't do anything. And I remember at the time I was just trying to operate the situation and, and, and I'm looking at the speed gauge, I'm hoping that the speed's gonna go down and I'm spinning and instead it's going up. So from 70, it's going to 75, 80, 85. And I see a car coming in front of me and it was 7 a.m. So it was school day, it was the weekday. And I see a woman with two kids in the back. And I saw, I remember I told myself, I remember this like it was yesterday. It was like, do not hit them no matter what happens. If you fell asleep, it's on you. I remember just taking guilt and just speaking to myself. I was like, if you fell asleep, that's on you, but you're not hitting anybody. You're not taking anybody today. And I, with everything I had, I would just swear about turn the wheel to the right. And all of a sudden, here it goes, like it was a utility pole or something from concrete, like something solid that I'm heading to. And I remember that for the first time in my life, and I usually a person that if something comes my way, I'm like one of those martial arts instructor, you know, instincts, so reflexes. So I'm blocking and dodging. And I remember heading into this pole at 85 miles per hour, and all of a sudden time starts slowing down. It just almost stops, and I'm smiling. Don't know why. I'm like, I thought at the time, like the, the, the physical me thought that I'm making my I'm making myself laugh because I believe, like, is this how I go? Like in my uniform on the back on the way back from work, not seeing, you know, seeing my kids getting married, and I was laughing. But no, that wasn't the reason. I welcomed something. And later on, welcome me. And here it goes. I remember the, the, the blast that hit the impact. And it was like the most horrible sound of explosion, something out of this world. And I see the little pieces of the Arabic starting to, to inflate. And I'm out. And the second I open my eyes, I'm upside down completely crushed. Now think that you see through swords of metal in your body and you are having the best moment of your life. So I'm upside down and open my eyes and I remember everything. It wasn't like I was out or unconscious that I'm like, what's going on? What am I seeing? I remember everything. I remember falling asleep or being tired and, and dozing off. I remember me trying to control the vehicle and I remember the impact. I remember everything. The only thing I didn't remember was probably the rollover, the time that I ended up in the middle of the field. And I opened my eyes and it's the best feeling in the world. I remember I was fascinated with every little sense, with every little thing. And it's all feelings. I'm still in the car, I'm in this world. This world all of a sudden became like, if I can explain, if you're familiar with the show Stranger Things, there is this dimension, the upside down, where everything is the same, but it's kind of like, you know, it's got just pieces of paper everywhere. So everything was just like peaceful. And I remember first I was fascinated with the sound. 
the sound was like the most beautiful quiet you've ever not heard in your life. It was almost like, you know, sometimes back in the day when we were kids, like we used to go to the library and it was like, you gotta be, well, when you're in the middle of a test and all you hear are the fluorescent lights above you and that's it. But it was even a hundred million times more quiet than that. I experienced that in my five-year-old like, drowning. I know what you mean. Yes. So it's almost like your soul is taking a seat on a bench and resting for the first time ever being familiar with, it, with itself. And I remember that there wasn't no smell. It wasn't no pain. And I'm like, I know the situation. I was like, how come I'm not hurting right now? Like, I'm, and you know, the, the impact, like the worst part of the car was the driver's side. It was almost like it was aimed to hurt, to hurt me, to crush me. The car, and I have videos that later on I will someday post them on my page, me walking around the car the day after. And it shows that they were like, the car was, the car was torn to pieces and it formed like two forks, two, like two sets of swords, and they were just crossing zigzag and then i'm like okay and i'm not like i don't feel pain i don't see blood but i'm there and i remember trying to get out and like i'm in a dream state i'm kicking nothing just most beautiful thing i must tell you that i always take a little extra second to describe was the fact that i wasn't even thinking about anything the thoughts were gone you know it's hard to realize that because we always think. We even think when we relax. Somewhere on an island, we can be just chanting, but still think about how much fun we're having. We're always operating in those lower frequencies or higher, it doesn't matter. At that time of impact, it wasn't even a thought. I was just like, I existed. I was there. And I remember that I'm trying to get out and I'm up, upside down. So everything was like upside down view. And I'm looking outside the window and I see this lady. She's like in her mid sixties, wearing like clothes that from the either 17 or 1800s, dusty old clothes. And she looked like just old school. Uh, she had a head scarf. And I remember that one part of her cheek was had like a severe uh, burn scar on it. Just one side and she was just pacing back and forth outside the car and I was in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of a field. And I remember that I was trying to wave because I couldn't even make a sound, there was no sound. I was just trying to communicate and ask her to help me. And all she did was pacing back and forth and just nodding no with her head. And I remember that the old me would have get so ticked off and upset and judgmental and freaking out. And this is the first time when I re that when I didn't recognize myself or the one that I used to be growing up up until seven years ago. I finally was just judging her for good, meaning like I was like, hey, maybe she's just afraid to approach because the car is going to set on fire or something. Maybe she doesn't have the right medical qualifications to take care of you and she wouldn't want to harm you. So I was just thinking all these positive things instead of judging. And I don't understand. I'm like, in, with myself, I'm in an argument, but I was like, I just want to stay here forever. I love it. I love this crash. I love this moment. And I was like, what's going on? And all of a sudden I'm still waving and she's saying, no, no. And then I gave up at one point and I was like, you know what? I'm just going to enjoy this. So I closed my eyes and was like, I'm going to rest a little bit. Instead of freaking out, I was like, I'm going to rest. And I closed my eyes and the second I opened them, the split second I opened them, the world came to life, just like you would play a pause movie. Everything was like, doo -doo 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 -doo, sound and smoke. And I feel the pressure of being crushed. And I remember gasoline and the car was still turned on and like dozens of people around me. And I see this paramedic just running at me and everybody's screaming and I hear them echoing. And I'm fine. I'm, I'm like, what are you doing? Why are you interrupting me? <laughs> and they're screaming. I was like, hey, hey, don't move, don't move. And I'm telling him, sir, I'm okay. And he was like, you think you're okay? You're not okay. So he gave me IV through the window. 
they can look at that through the window. And I'm like, and I remember like it was yesterday. And I said, sir, why can't you just get me out of here? Why can't get myself out? And he was like, we can't. We need to use the jaws of life, which is for those who are not familiar, is our hydraulic uh, machinery the firefighter use to tear apart a vehicle and extract the passengers. And I remember the firefighters came and it was just a mess. And here I am like in this high feeling, which is literally a high because you get your soul to this consciousness that you're really outside your body. And all of them are just going crazy. And I'm like, I'm really okay. And don't move, don't move, don't move. So they, I did, at one point I was like, you know, I'm gonna just play along with that because I don't want them to think I'm crazy. and I don't want them to use force or anything. So I'm letting him take me and I'm like, we're rushing to the ICU and everybody is in the car and this sheriff lady was sitting there and I'm like, excuse me, ma'am, you know, can I ask you a question? And she said, well, better not, you need to rest, you're going to the ICU. I was like, no, I, I really need to ask you a question. And she said, well, go ahead, what's that? And I said, isn't that against the law for a citizen not to help another citizen in distress? Because, you know, this lady, and she was like, what are you talking about? So we were the first in the scene. There was nobody there. And then I realized I was like, better than talk about it. It was fun. It's not even worth them thinking you're crazy. Just still play along. And I remember going to the ICU and the drama still continues. Everybody's around, just running around me and bringing all the MRIs and the CTs to me. I don't even have to go to them. They think I'm gone. They think I'm something's wrong. Everything's broken. I remember after a couple of hours, the doctor comes in and he says, I'm gonna have to let you go. So what do you mean? And I remember I had like a friend, a neighbor and a friend there. And they, he goes, you don't even have a bruise. That is scratch. The only scratch I had was in my hand. And that was because the firefighters took me out like too fast and I, I hit a glass, but that was after the experience. So listen to this, 80 miles an hour, a crash that 99% of people would have died in because I rolled over apparently five times after the impact. So if that didn't kill me, that was supposed to kill me, that was supposed to kill me or, or break my neck or something. And I remember that I didn't have a scratch. I went back to work two days after and I went to get the battery out of my car the same day. And the gentleman from this yard, like this like the uh, car lot, he goes, you know, my condolences as a gentleman that you know was killed in this car. And I said, like, well, what are you talking about? It's me and I have nothing. And then the dreams and the visions, and then the transformation of my soul. And all of a sudden I get wisdoms about numbers and stuff, stuff that I never chose to, to learn, stuff that I never read about. And I dream about angels and all of a sudden helping people communicate with their loved ones and telling them stuff that only they know. Never, though I've never done it, like I've never been a medium, though I have those things I just chose not to. This is not my mission in here. My mission is way different. It's to enlighten souls, is to let them know what they can do themselves. Because there's a lot of imbalance going on in this world, especially a spiritual one with the physical, with all the wars, with all the stuff. It's all got an equivalent. Think about a mirror. Everything physical in this world have a complete identical translation to spiritual. And this is what we go when we pass. And only then, depends on our action, depends on what we had here spiritual. This is, these are going to be the only weapons we have there. And this is why I come to Warren and say, you're going to work out on your body and all the stuff that this world can provide for you, but are you not going to enlighten a candle inside of you? You're going to go there dim and it's going to be dark. And it was dark for me because I didn't always make the bad, you know, the good choices in my life. And I made never nothing bad or wrong or criminal, but I made bad choices in what I chased and after, you know, in life. I was materialistic. I was rude. I was, I mean, I was, it's just not who I am. And I know that I came here to correct that. And I know that there's somebody else that was reborn in me seven years ago. And I've accepted it because I've been researching about it and all these walking stories and stuff. And <clears throat> I finally decided to come out of the spiritual closet and be like, I'll be there for people. No, I'm not going to run this uh, business. Not, I'm here on a mission that is, none of that is my concern. You know, when my wife does all that stuff, I just show up. And I help people all the way from India to Israel to America daily, and I don't even charge. I'm just helping. Because what happened to me, 
was something that a lot of people are not familiar with. And that's usually a good thing, but it comes with a lot of trials. For every enlightenment, the other, you know, because I told you there was balance. For every good, there is also evil. And we can just all be positive and light and then ignore what's out there. Because when we ignore what's out there, we don't fight it. We don't stand up for that. And for everybody who's enlightened, they're usually going to get dragged down by those other forces in a language of trials in real life, like debts and this and mortgage and problems and people and fighting and all these bad energies. And I learned to tell the difference and I learned to warn people. This is my story on a nutshell. How do you help people? How's that look? You know, I, I, um, I told a lot of people that anymore, one of my, um, what are the signs of me just also growing in a way faster pace than it was prior to me coming back here because I had to leave the United States and come here. And I knew that it was all for that mission. Like there was, I was almost carried here. And I met my wife, which was always my twin flame. And a lot of people from the spiritual world, I'm sure are familiar with that too, which is the feminine part of my soul. And it needed to happen. And we needed to face what we face. And I help people by talking to them, seeing their aura. I just see souls. I don't even see people by their looks or by what they try to present me in the physical. That's simply, it's almost like an x-ray straight to the core. And I help them pick themselves up. And even if people, usually people who are dealing with the loss, and I always say that this is my main mission, is help those who deal with the loss, convince them, maybe give them a 1% chance of comfort to know that this is not the end because I know there is no end. There was only a beginning and there's eternity, but there are stations which we have to cross. We were born there in the world of souls, and this is where we're going to. Everybody in their own journey. We can, as a collective, believe in that and produce a lot of light and be grateful. But just like in real life, even souls have their own personal life and journey and stuff that they need to correct. So I help them pick themselves up, and I give them comfort, which is a lot more than a lot of science today can do for them. What are your visions like? Um, usually is there's one that is always repeating itself. And I remember in many, many groups and NDE groups, because in the beginning for years, I thought I had an NDE. So I was like NDE all the way in all the groups and everything that I could find in my own and in different languages. But I remember then I was sharing a lot of insights in the form of videos and just encouraging to the soul, speaking to people. And people already automatically can recognize that it comes from a different place. And a lot of people feel my energies like I feel theirs. And there's a lot of people like me on this planet. And I remember this vision of these seven moons. I'm in bed looking up, there are seven moons. And there's one big one in the middle. They're all full moons and one big one in the middle. And I'm going all the way up, attracting myself. Well, that's like magnetizing me to this big middle moon. And the closer I get to it, the more fear. And it's not like fear that something bad's going to happen to you, but it's like fear that it's like, oh my God, like a stage fear, but multiplied by a million. Like butterflies, like no, 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 be, no never before. And then I wake up. Same time at the same height. And then there's the angels. And then there's visions of bliss and good things. And sometimes bad things, even though I try not to dream about them. But And the visions are also in um, signs of numbers, which me and my wife were able to even capture how those numbers are chasing us. And I was able to realize that this is my wife's mother who passed away a few years back. My wife lost both her parents and she's only 33, but her mom, she's the youngest, communicating with her with those sequences of numbers. And we get them everywhere when we were able to be like, you know what? We can't just say, hey, we saw these, 
and people are just not gonna believe us. We're gonna just capture that. So every time those messages come, we capture so we can be like, hey, these are one of the signs that our loved ones send to us because they can, and we're still limited. And it's beautiful to see. So this type of visions, but I'm mostly focused on my mission, which is to really try to help souls pick themselves up <clears throat> because um, there's a lot of people who are just depressed and sad and, and you know, and, and nobody ever tried that angle on them. It's either a psychiatric or this or that. And, you know, it's not always the answer. Um, sometimes when you talk to the core and you can spark that candle, because I feel like I have like these spiritual matches and I just go and like people's souls. And that's what I get as a feedback. So I know that's the mission. I'm still learning. I'm still battling between this new gift, this new soul and the memories from before. So it's still new, but I'm just embracing it. And I, I'm, happy, I'm happy about it. And it's, it's bringing a lot of blessings. So I'm kind of going along. Did you feel different when you went back to work? Uh, yeah, I'm different as a person. I mean, even in a relationship, like I got divorced because I got different. Like it's just not the same person. But people don't know that just like birth, when you're waiting for this special gift, a special child to arrive, you go through nine months of a very uncomfortable events. Pregnancy in itself is not supposed to be easy. And then of course the contraction and labor itself. So there's also a labor for spiritual awakening, which people don't understand. A lot of the time they fall into these deep holes. And they don't know why they can't get out. And they don't understand that this is for their good because they will never be given a trial they can't pass. But instead of trying to pass it, they just accept defeat. And sometimes it's a sign of just awakening. It always gets up darker before it gets bright, right? Uh, what made you leave corrections? The accident. Remember that I, I would like I would having those nightmares and dreams and angels and and there wouldn't even be panic attacks. It would just be me feeling like the presence of. I tell people in in those days, and thank God I don't pay attention to it anymore. But in those days after, I told my ex-wife that if she could see right now, if people could see what I'm seeing that's surrounding us at every given moment right now. As far as, you know, because for every creation, like I said, there is balance for everything physical, even the smallest organism, even some sea creatures, stuff that are just created in the physical. There's the same thing in the spiritual, all kinds of spiritual stuff. And if our eyes weren't, weren't um, if our eyes weren't limited to see what we're supposed to see and to act with this body and just to act from our soul, then we would be getting a heart attack on the spot. If we, if we could see what's going on, everybody would just get a heart attack from fear. If you were just to see it with these physical eyes. And I saw that. And at the time I got panic attacks. I didn't know what was going on. And then I started like aligning myself, like a tuning a guitar. It took a while for it to start playing good chords, but it has to do a lot with acceptance. I didn't want to accept that gift. Mm -mm. What were you I wasn't seeing? Very... Spirits? Excuse me? What were you seeing? Spirits? I just every little thing for things that are because. See, creation is not just moving by itself. Like a lot of the stuff that we take for granted from the way that we blink our eyes, you know, to something that is beating this heart without battery, to make plants grow, to make creatures shelter skins. All these things from the spiritual are angels. They were created for just to move that creation in a physical way. And it's amazing to see there's like for every little thing that it's alive, there's something moving it. And all of a sudden you see that it's like almost like you put a VR goggles on you and you're like, what? And you understand. And then you get not even scared. Like I remember you get respectful. I was respectful. I'm no longer scared to die. I'm not looking forward to dying because I know I got a lot of mission. I got a lot of corrections to do before I go back again. But oh, mostly I welcome that meaning when it comes. So it's not something scary. And that's why I try to tell people, don't be sad. I know it's hard. I know it's easy said and done. And agony is part of it. It's part of that physical love and it's okay. But at one point, know that your loved one is alive and seeing you in pain. What do you think they feel when they see mommy and daddy or brother and sister? You think they're gonna be in a good mood? Would you be in a good mood if you see your sister or daughter? 
just in bad mood, God forbid, all the time. No. So I teach people that and it, it clicks. At least I hope and pray it does. Yeah, my second NDE, I was brought into the future to see how my boys would be if I didn't go back. And um, one of my sons was in a lot of emotional pain for, you know, have lost his mother and it was horrible. You know, it's like, it's like, I'll tell you, um, when I describe it to people, just like when you go to the doctor and I always say physical and spiritual, think about that mirror effect that is existing and a lot of people don't pay attention to. You go to the doctor and like, you go to the ER, they usually will welcome you based on the severity of your injury or illness, right? So even levels of agony and pain, you know, when we lose our parents in an older age and we kind of, this is the world we know, we know that this is according to the circle of life. Yeah, it's very, very sad, but at the same time, we, we accept a little faster. If people pass in a tragic accident or in a early age, this is a shock that gets everybody and gets a lot of people confused and looking for answers. Well, why him? Why now? Why that early? Then you have that one pain that is almost like with all due respect to the others above them all, which is a parent who happens to bury a child. There is no greater emotional pain no greater torture to the human soul than on this earth, a parent shall bury their child. This is against the nature. This is against the order of creation. And when it happens, it causes a trauma to the soul that a lot of people, if not most, if not all, never recover from. But only those who know that those tragic moments when you have to bury your child are also in a way a reward to your soul and graduating it from the school of souls to know that they could bury that agony and still move forward with hope some of them do and some of them move on and pass the test but it's very hard to talk to these people but the comfort that i give them and to see and hear their voices after I comfort them while they bury the child is most more rewarding than any amount of cash you would present in front of me at this moment. And this is what I'm ordered to do as long as my body allows me. You were talking to me right after back fusion surgery, fresh out of the surgery room. And I'm in a lot of physical pain, but my soul is working overtime and it's full of joy. So this is what I'm battling with, but again, it's all a matter that back of- surgery? Yes, ma'am. Okay. A back fusion, I have four screws, two plates, two rods, and it's not even near, I'm not supposed to move my back and I'm in a lot of nerve damage pain, but hey, all of that, it doesn't even exist when my soul is just coming out of my body and I can see my own aura. See, I tell a lot of people who have NDEs, who are still confused about their experience and they're talking about the light. I tell them that there's differences in the light. There is the light that you see when you almost pass or when you pass and that there is the great light which you become part of one of these days forever. But the light that we see usually in NDEs are the lights of our own soul. Think about if you were in a car in a road with no street lights and you turn your brights. That's what happens to us when we pass and we have NDE. All of a sudden there's nobody. So you see your real form, you see those bright lights, and these are your auras of your soul. Aura in Hebrew means light. Or is light, aura is like a halo, a light. That means the soul is either outside the body, almost outside the body, or enlightened enough that it takes itself like in an elevator, up and down from the body. But they call high. A lot of people when they uh, consume either whatever they consume, they call, they call it high. Why they not call it middle or sideways or down? They, they call it high because it's literally elevating your soul and you feel higher than what you are. Now, as a walk-in, do you feel like the old soul you were is gone and someone else is there or how is that? Yeah, I, I feel 
I see the memories. I love the people. Am I going to tell you that I feel the same connection as I did before I moved to America? No, and I don't blame moving to America for that. I blame the walking. But it's, yeah, it's my family. I'm never going to deny it. But what I feel is that it's almost like I'm trying to accept it and give it earthly terms. So people don't think I lost it. Not, not that I care. I'm like, I'm completely disengaged from humanity in those days. But at the same time, I'm going to say humanity. I mean, the the day-to-day the -day stuff because I'm recovering from surgery. So I'm like into myself. I talk to people. So what I'm saying is that I feel like it's just, I call it a, a severe 180 change in personality. Though deep inside, I know what happened. And I'm slowly recovering and uncovering and getting in peace with that because it, it gets a bit scary because it bears a responsibility. And all of a sudden, a lot of trials are coming my way and a lot of bad energies and I have to dodge and block and this, and it's, it gets old too. Why did you leave America? There was a war here and I was afraid of my family. So I came to support, ended up eating my twin flame, which made me pretty much uh, needing to stay here and visiting periodically my children. But it, it meant to happen, so it's okay. That's why I share this. People need to know the chain of events. I don't. I don't care. It's not my personal life. It's not a lot of people's. It's, it's not about people's business. It is people's business because if they can look at my life and they have like a life that just goes like all in turns and they like don't understand and they think it's bad and they just go and get drunk because life is bad to them instead of saying, oh, maybe just life's taken somewhere else. I'm supposed to be. And they'll find the light. I found the light through this. Everybody you know, in reality, it's supposed to be like, oh my God, I'm no, I'm not stuck here at all for a reason. And I'm, I'm celebrating it every day. Are you working in corrections or law enforcement? No, I work in a lab. I'm a lab worker. Um, yeah, um, but currently, obviously, I'm not going to be working for a while. I won't even move my back and start physical therapy for six more months, according to my doctor. So. Did you hurt your back or is just something that uh, we know I was a martial arts instructor 15 years MMA guy like so again all this physical macho world. I wasn't taking my fighters to like sold out arenas and overseas and we were all and I loved that because it was also you know I was I was teaching I was passing knowledge and I was teaching I was even then even my old soul was um, um, willing to help and teach but then after the accident. I was becoming more like a father to my students. I stopped charging money. I almost went out of business because I saw all my people and I helped them change their lives. And I have living proofs of success stories of my students who from criminal records to opening their own schools of martial arts. I'm not gonna mention names, but it's known. My oldest son, Matthew, was in the world championships in jiu-jitsu in November in Las Vegas. There you go. Heard. That, that was my world. I still, I still, I still follow. I still like love a lot of the people from there. But again, I'm, I'm so uh, into my mission right now that those those things, um, you know, I don't do anything distracting anymore. Is there anything else that you'd like to share that you didn't? No, get? but I can um, thank you and uh, tell you that I appreciate you so much for giving me the stage and um, really letting me speak and tell the story and asking the perfect question. So I find you a partner on hopefully enlightening a lot of people watching um, this video. Well, thank you. And I hope you accept that role and I appreciate you a lot. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And heal well. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. Bye-bye.